guys, Mr. Backerberg here. Lesson 1.6 is all about parent functions. Uh, you can see there's a lot going on in objective number one. We're looking at identifying and recognizing graphs of those parent functions. There are actually eight parent functions that we're going to take a look at. You can see the list of them there. And then for number two, we are going to evaluate what's known as the greatest integer function. So the first parent function that we're going to take a look at are just linear functions. So a linear function is something in the form y equals mx plus b, or in our function notation, f of x equals mx plus b. A couple ways we can tell we're dealing with a linear function. If we're looking at the graph, we know linear just means a straight line. If we're looking at the function or the equation itself, we should be looking for a plane x with no powers on it at all. So some characteristics of a linear function. Well, we know that m thing in the equation is our slope. We know that b value on the end gives us our y-intercept. Some other characteristics that we have, the domain is the set of all real numbers. Usually when we're talking about domain, things we can run into are like division by zero, we run into a problem with that, and square roots and negatives, we run into problems with that. We don't have any of that going on with a linear function, so we can safely plug in any x value that we want. When we're plugging in those x values, we can safely or we will get back any real number type of answer. So our range is the set of all real numbers. As far as intercepts, we already talked about that y-intercept with our b value. Quick way to find the x-intercept is by going with the opposite of b over m. Our line is increasing if the slope is positive. So our line is going up if the slope is positive. Our line is going down or it's decreasing if the slope is negative. And then it's constant if our slope is zero. A couple special types of linear functions, one of which is a constant function, so that's something that looks like f of x equals some constant value c. What you'll notice in here is there's no x, meaning that the slope is zero. So if we look at the equation f of x equals three, zero slope means flat horizontal line through that y value of three. The next special linear function is just our identity function, so f of x equals x. So slope is one, so we get this straight line going through the origin with a slope of one. So I'm gonna run through this example real quick, uh, writing out a linear function based on some given information. We're given that f of negative two is equal to six, and we're given that f of four is equal to nine. So what we need to remember is that information really gives us some ordered pairs. So this is the ordered pair negative two, six, and the second bit of information is the ordered pair four, negative nine. Since we're writing the equation or writing the function, we've got two points, so we could go with that two-point form that we talked about earlier in chapter one, or we could find the slope and then use one of the points in our point-slope form. And that's actually the way I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna find the slope first and then use point-slope form. So I'm gonna deal with my y values. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Across the top, we get negative 15. Across the bottom, we get six, and that reduces down to negative five halves. So there's our slope. Now I just need to pick a point to work with. I'm gonna use the first point just because the values are a little bit lower, maybe easier to work with. So we go y minus our y value equals our slope m times x minus our x value. A little cleanup on the end with the double negative y minus six is equal to negative five halves x plus two. Doing a little distributive property on the right hand side, we get negative five halves x. If we distribute the negative five halves to the two, we get minus five. Left hand side is still y minus six. And then we just need to add the six over to the right hand side. So y equals negative five halves x plus one. Now we are writing a function, so I'm gonna write this out in function notation, replacing the y with f of x equals negative five halves x plus one. So there's our linear function. Our next parent function is a quadratic function. So we're looking at f of x equals x squared, or the graph of a parabola. Okay, those are the two ways to identify a quadratic function, seeing that squared on an x, or by seeing the parabola graph. As far as the domain of a quadratic, 
we can safely plug in any real number x because squaring something isn't one of those issues that we could run into. As far as the range, when we're dealing with this f of x equals x squared, the range, the y values that we get back are always going to be greater than or equal to zero, since squaring a number will always make it positive. We've got intercepts at zero, zero, so both the x-intercept and the y-intercept. A quadratic function is an example of an even function, since it has that y-axis symmetry. We can see that our graph is increasing on the interval from zero to infinity, so this right half of our graph. We can see that it's decreasing on the left-hand side of our graph from negative infinity to zero. As I mentioned earlier, it does have y-axis symmetry, and this graph has a minimum point at the bottom of this valley here at zero, zero. Next on our list of parent functions, we've got a cubic function. So we're looking at f of x equals x cubed. Uh, just like the quadratic function, the domain here is going to be all real numbers. We can safely cube any number. Range, we're going to get back all of those y value numbers, so any real numbers there for the range. As far as this f of x equals x cubed goes, it has its intercepts, both x and y, at 0, 0. This is an example of an odd function, since this one has that origin symmetry. Our graph is increasing over the entire interval from negative infinity to positive infinity. So as we work our way left to right, our graph is always going up. And then lastly, like I said, we've got origin symmetry going on with this cubic function. Next up, we've got a square root function, so something like f of x equals the square root of x. We do need to be a little bit careful here with the domain. Remember, we can't do square roots of negative numbers, so as far as those x values go, it's going to be all the real numbers that are greater than or equal to zero. When we plug those things in, since we're plugging in positive numbers, we're going to get back positive numbers, so our range is going to be all the real numbers that are greater than or equal to zero. We do have x and y intercepts going on at zero, zero and our graph is increasing on the interval from zero to infinity. Number five is a reciprocal function, so the example we're taking a look at is f of x equals one over x. Since we've got the x on the bottom of our fraction, we do need to be careful about plugging zero into the domain. So we can see here that our domain runs from negative infinity to zero, not included, and then from zero to infinity, again zero is not included. Okay, this is called union notation with a couple of intervals. As far as the range goes, we've got similar things going on. Since we can't plug in zero, we're not gonna get zero as an answer with one divided by x. Uh, we don't have any x or y intercepts going on. They're not graphed out on here, but let me draw them in real quick. There are actually asymptotes running along the x-axis and the y-axis, which prevents our graph from crossing either of those things. This is an odd function. It does have origin symmetry. It's decreasing on the entire interval from negative infinity to zero, and then from zero to infinity. And again, as I said, it has origin symmetry. Six is an absolute value function, so we've got f of x equals the absolute value of x. There are no restrictions on our domain. We can safely plug in any number from negative infinity to positive infinity. Our range, the answers we get back, are all going to be positive numbers since the absolute value makes our answer positive. So our range there runs from zero to infinity. We do have x and y intercepts at zero, zero on this graph. Absolute value function is an even function since it has y-axis symmetry. It's decreasing on the interval from negative infinity to zero and then increasing from zero to infinity. As I said, again, y-axis symmetry. You might not be as familiar with step functions as you are some of the other functions that we've taken a look at so far, but a step function is just anything that has a stair-step look to it, so like this graph on the bottom right-hand corner. The step function we're going to talk about is what's called the greatest integer function, so f of x equals the greatest integer x. A quick definition of what that is, basically the greatest integer function says that we take whatever that x value is that we're given and we round it down. The domain here, it's gonna be all real numbers. We can safely plug in any x value that we want. Our range, the answers that we get back for those y values are always going to be integer values. We've got a y-intercept at the point zero, zero. Our x-intercept though is a little bit of a range of values because our graph is crossing or touching the x-axis at this entire region in here at this interval from zero to one. 
Some other characteristics, this graph is constant between each pair of consecutive integers, meaning like between zero and one, our graph is constant. Between one and two, our graph is constant, so on and so forth. But then our graph jumps vertically one unit at each integer value. We're gonna do a quick example with a greatest integer function, just plugging some x values into this function that we're given. So we've got f of x equals the greatest integer of x plus two. And first we're gonna plug in negative one half. So if we look at f of negative one half equals greatest integer of negative one half plus two. Well, if we take negative one half plus two, we get one and a half and our greatest integer function says round down. So the answer here is just one. If we look at plugging in one, f of one, we get the greatest integer of one plus two. Well, that's just three, greatest integer of three, and three is already an integer, so the answer is three. If we look at plugging in negative five halves, f of negative five halves, Well, negative five halves is negative two and a half. So if we take negative two and a half and we add two, we get negative a half. Okay, now we're rounding down. So the integer value when we round negative a half down is actually negative one. As far as our last parent function, the piecewise defined function, there is no real definition of it. It's just any combination of any of those other functions that we've talked about over a specified domain. So the best way to talk about it is by just doing an example. So we're gonna graph out this piecewise defined function where we've got f of x equals negative one half x minus six for x values that are less than or equal to negative four. And then we've got f of x equals x plus five for x values that are greater than negative four. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna make an x and y chart for each individual piece of this graph and I'm gonna deal with this top piece first. It says we're gonna use negative one half x minus six if we're dealing with x values that are less than or equal to negative four. So I'm gonna plug in some x values that are less than or equal to negative four. I'm gonna use even values just because we're gonna be multiplying by negative a half. So I'm gonna use like negative eight, negative six, and negative four. Plugging those in, well negative a half times negative eight is positive four, and if we take four minus six, we get negative two. Negative a half times negative six is positive three, and then positive three minus six is negative three. Plugging in negative four, negative four times negative a half is positive two, and then minus six, we get negative four. So now we just need to plot out all those points. So at negative eight, we're at negative two, so left eight down two spaces. At negative six, we're at negative three. At negative four, we're at negative four. And then we connect our dots with a line. Now we need to graph out that other piece. So I'm gonna make a separate X and Y chart for this bottom piece, X plus five, for X values that are greater than negative four. Now it says it's gotta be greater than negative four, but I actually am gonna plug in negative four, and then maybe like negative three, negative two. So if we plug those things in, Negative four plus five is one, negative three plus five is two, and negative two plus five is three. Now since negative four wasn't technically included in our domain, we have to be careful about how we graph this out. Remember we're talking about like a number line with not included values, we put an open circle to show that that value is not included. Same thing happens here when we're graphing this one out. So at negative four, one, we've actually got an open circle at that point since it's not included. And then at negative three, we're at two, and at negative two, we're at three. And then again, connect those dots with a line. That's it as far as this video goes. So please remember to fill out the Google form linked in the description down below. And thanks for watching.